So this morning, I will be speaking on, I've titled the message, The Glorious Standard of Truth. The Glorious Standard of Truth. And the concept of, of truth is something that is heavily diluted today and misrepresented. And you know the Oxford English Dictionary? Every year they have what they call the word of the year. And the word of the year is often a word that in that year had great cultural significance. And so there's going to be a final list, final list of words, and towards the end of the year they'll release the word of the year. And in the year 2016, the word was post-truth. Post-truth. It's, it's, a high, it's a compound word, post-truth, and it's a very interesting word. And a lot of social commentators from that stage were saying, we've officially entered a post-truth era as humanity. And I'll read the definition of post-truth. It says, um, Cambridge Dictionary, it says, relating to a situation in which people are more likely to accept an argument based on their emotions and beliefs rather than one based on facts. Dictionary.com says it like this. Post-truth is relating to or existing in an environment in which facts are viewed as irrelevant or less important than personal beliefs and opinions. And emotional appeals are used to influence public opinion. Who's ever heard that the term my truth or your truth? No? Speak your truth, bae, you know? And unfortunately, where we've come to as a society is that the concept of my truth is given, given greater weight to the concept of the truth. And when, when the phrase is used, my truth, what it actually simply means is my experience. Just because we've experienced something in a certain way doesn't mean that that is objectively true. And so we live in a post-truth society where feelings are placed higher than facts. And it's so difficult to get to the truth today, socially, morally, politically, it, everything is just so muddy because the concept of my truth based on how I feel is given greater weight than the truth. Remember this message is titled, The Glorious Standard of Truth. The Glorious Standard of Truth. So keep that in the back of your minds as we, as we journey through this. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy 3, 15 says, Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one should act in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. Let's read it again. In case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one should act in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. Now, that word household, we've been doing a, the, the, the main thrust behind our teachings in the last few months have been on building strong families. That word for household is the word oikos, which simply means a family. So what Paul is saying is the church the household of God, the family of God in the earth is there to be the pillar and the support of truth in the world. Now that word support means to prop up something or to support and the root of this word means to be firm or immovable. To be firm or immovable. So our purpose as the church of Christ in the earth is to be a pillar. What do pillars do? 
They support. What we are supporting is the name of God, Father, Son, Spirit. As the church, we are the pillar and the support of truth. And again, that word support has something to do with something that's firm, solid, unbreakable, immovable. So it's quite a, it's not an easy task to be the pillar of truth in a post-truth world. Now what is truth? Now the Greek word aletheia simply means what is true in any circumstance or what is true in any matter under consideration simply put it means truth does not change depending on circumstance it's something that's objectively true objectively stands on its own regardless of any external influences the objective truth so this Greek word for, for truth, aletheia, has to do with the objective truth. It's truth all by itself. It doesn't need us to validate it as truth. It is just the truth. Jesus clarifies exactly what truth is in John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So when we say this, that we as the church are supposed to be the pillar of truth, we are saying we are supposed to be this pillar of the Word of God in the earth. We are to become a living embodiment of the Word of God in this world. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is not just something that is written about God, but the Word is God Himself. So again, we can read in 1 Timothy, we are to be the pillar of truth, we are to be the pillar of God Himself in this world. Because God and His Word are one, and His Word is truth. So to be the pillar of truth is to be the very pillar of God's presence in this world. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. So this tells us that truth is not just something we ought to declare, but truth is something we ought to become. Remember, Jesus is not just our Savior, He's our standard. He's our pattern. So of Jesus saying, I am the truth. As sons of God in Christ, we are to become the truth. So again, truth, being this pillar of truth in the world, is not just about going around and trying to correct every injustice or immorality, but it's about becoming a standard through our lifestyles in these environments. And that is our declaration that we are an immovable pillar of truth in this post-truth world. Amen. So I'd like to take some time to explore the topic of glory quickly. Because being the light of the world and being the pillar and standard of truth, we've got to understand how glory works. Now, the, the, the Hebrew and Greek words for glory, kabod and doxa, mean a weight, splendor, honor, majesty, opinion, or esteem. Weight, splendor, glory, honor, majesty, opinion, or esteem. And, and quite simply it means to behold glory is something that is seen and you then esteem something based on what you are looking at. And we must be careful not to have an Old Testament view of glory. Remember, in the New Testament it tells us that what is written in the Old Testament law serves as a type and shadow for New Testament principles. 
So we have to read the Old Testament through a New Testament lens. Now in the Old Testament, when it speaks about glory, you have the example at the tent of meeting, the cloud of glory would manifest. It was, they could literally see a cloud coming down and they said, that is the glory. That's in Exodus 40. In Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai, when Moses was with God, the glory of God manifested as rumblings, violent winds, flashing lights. That was described as the glory. In the temple, in 1 Kings chapter 10, it says, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Again, descri described as a, as a cloud. Now, we have to be careful when defining glory in the new covenant because it's not that. It's not a cloud-like presence that comes amongst us. We've got to be very careful to distinguish things. I think sometimes we tend to overlap how we define spiritual things. You know, the manifest presence of God is different to the glory of God, which is different to the anointing. And sometimes we use those interchangeably. I feel the anointing. I feel the glory. I feel the manifest presence of God. But there are three distinct things. And unfortunately, sometimes when we think about this concept of glory, we divert to the Old Testament view of it's just the stick weighty presence. And the word literally means that weight. But as we'll see shortly, it's more about that weight, that impression on us as the sons and something that we then reflect. And we'll get there. So in the Old Testament, God was all about showing his glory to the people. In the New Covenant, God wants to demonstrate his glory through a people. In the Old Covenant, God visibly showed his glory to the people. The cloud, the smoke, the fire. Those were just pictures and symbols that highlight New Testament principles of God manifesting himself amongst his people. But in the New Covenant, God wasn't, doesn't want to demonstrate his glory just to us, but primarily through us. So we are not observers or just consumers of glory. We are the very producers of glory. Are we all good on that point? So we must, we must just be, be careful that we do not have that view of glory, that it's just some kind of presence. And those pictures were used in the Old Testament just to highlight the fact that God manifests himself amongst his people. Now, glory is something that is native to the earth. Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, the angels are speaking. It says, and one angel cried out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Not the whole heaven is full of his glory. I know we sometimes refer to heaven as that's glory. That's glory land. Angels are not saying heaven is full of your glory. They're saying the earth is full of your glory. Habakkuk 2.14, the prophet says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. What percentage of the sea is covered by water? 100%. So this is saying that as the sea is full of water, so God's glory is going to cover this earth. That's, a, that's an end-time prophetic picture of the mature church. So glory, if angels want to observe God's glory, God's splendor, God's majesty, God's character, they're not going to find it in heaven because they can't look at it. They have to look to the sons of God in the earth. Look at this, Ephesians 3.10. Paul is speaking about the purpose of the church here again, and he says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. 
So we are not just called to be the pillar and standard of truth to this visible world. We are also the pillar and standard of truth to the invisible world. Because the angelic, the demonic, every spiritual being, our purpose is to simply declare the wisdom of God to them. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just about us. I mean, when we imagine if we're dragging our feet when it comes to our sonship and our development, the angels are looking at us and like, come on now, I want to see, see more of God and, you, and you're preventing me. So our representation in our sonship is more than just this visible world. That's why the angels cry out, the earth is full of his glory because that's where his sons are. And only sons can carry image and likeness of father. Hebrews chapter 1 clearly states, to which of the angels has he said, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. So the whole angelic realm, they're not sons of God. They can't carry nature and image. And part of our job as the church is to declare his glory to both the visible humanity, fallen humanity, as well as the invisible. Everybody say glory. Glory. Now, Let's look at how this played out in the life of Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 13 says, And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So he's speaking to his disciples, and without going too deep in the context, just that end part, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So this highlights a simple principle that as the sons of God, our job is to glorify our Father. And by glorifying Him, it simply means putting His nature on display. To glorify God means to put His nature on display wherever we find ourselves. Because in doing so, we are portraying His majesty, the weightiness of His presence. So, Jesus says, the the job of the Son to glorify the Father. In John 14, verse 8 and 9, Philip said to Him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to Him, have I been with you so long a time, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus visibilized his Father. Our Heavenly Father is invisible. Our Heavenly Father loves this world and the people in it. We need to make him visible wherever we find ourselves. So that like Jesus, we can say, if you have encountered me, you have encountered my Father. Because my life is all about putting him on display. If you have seen me, you have seen my Father. And that's something that we're all endeavoring towards. That our thinking, our thought patterns, our perspectives, our behaviors may be reflective of who our Heavenly Father is. John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. Everybody say flesh. And dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw His glory. Glory. So again, they're not speaking about some cloud or some presence. They're saying, when we looked at Jesus, there was something emitting from his life. We saw glory. Glory is something that has to be seen. It's something external when we put on the behavior, the character of our Father. But it says something interesting. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace 
and truth. Grace and truth on the inside equals glory on the outside. We don't need to ask God for glory so that we can reflect it. What we need to ask God is for grace and truth, and the result is the reflection of glory. Remember, we're speaking about being the pillar and the standard of truth in this world. So we, we know what truth is. Truth is the Word of God. So if we don't have the Word of God on the inside of us, we can't wing it and try and put on godly character. Glory is just a symptom of something that's residing in, internally. It's not something we can put on. It's like, okay, now I'm going to try and behave. It's when our lives are built upon the righteous standards of God's word, then we reflect the glory. So there's no shortcuts to this. It's about a life that is consistently built on the reception and obedience to the word of God. And as we engage and go along with that process, glory is emitted. So it says full of grace and truth. So full of the word of God. Now grace is... A big topic. <laughs> Last year, I did four very detailed sessions on the grace of God. And I, I'd encourage you all to have a listen to that on our YouTube channel. What is the grace of God? But just as a, as a quick overview, 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But by the grace of God, Paul is speaking, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain, but I labored even more than them, the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. So there's two principles there in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is saying, I am what I am by the grace of God. Meaning, when I receive grace, it configures my identity. My sense of self, my sonship identity is configured by me receiving grace. He also says, I work, but not in my own strength. It's the grace of God working in me. So grace does two things. It establishes identity, and it empowers us for function. It establishes identity and empowers us for function. So it's not just the amazing grace that saved us. That is 5% of what grace actually is. Salvation grace, Peter, I think Peter describes it as, or Paul, our entrance into grace. That's what salvation is, amazing grace. That is a free gift. We don't need to work for it. It's a gift of God. We've been saved by grace. But Peter says, now grow in grace. So grace is not just unmerited favor. Salvation grace is unmerited favor. But dominion grace, grace to live as the sons of God in this life, is merited. Because you have to now take the steps of obedience to attain it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the second part simply says, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What that simply means is whenever Christ is revealed, whenever the principles of Christ from his word are revealed and shared, grace is imparted to us. The grace of God comes to us through the word of God. When we sit under the speaking of the word of God, we're not just receiving the truth, you're receiving grace in the truth. This is just a very basic summary, but please, I encourage you to listen to the full series on grace. So why are we speaking about grace? Because of Jesus, it says, we saw glory, but we acknowledge that glory is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So we need to be a people, like Peter says, he says, fix your hope completely, not on the glory, on the grace that is coming to you. So, and I've said this before, whenever we're sitting under the word, 
You're not just listening to a sermon. You're not getting life advice on how to live this life victoriously. You're getting the grace of God. And that's, what we, that's, how, that's our attitude we need to adopt. I'm sitting here, I'm re- maybe I'm receiving facts, I'm receiving information, I'm receiving the word, but what I'm actually receiving is the grace. The grace of God locked up in the word. The manna locked up in the dew. Dew is a picture of the word of God. Every morning they had to collect the, go into the dew to collect the manna, the sustaining power. That's the grace. So we need the grace of God. Exodus 33, 18. Exodus 33, 18. It says, Moses is speaking. Moses is talking to God. Moses says, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be Gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. So Moses asked God, show me your glory. God didn't respond by showing him his glory. He responded by highlighting the principles of grace and truth. He says, I will pass by and proclaim the name And we know the word name means nature, the truth about God. So he's saying, I'm going to pass by you and download truth. Because if you want to understand and see my glory, that's the internal component of it. And I will be gracious on who to whom I will be gracious. Another reading of that is, I will show or impart or bestow grace on who I will impart or bestow grace to. So this is just an an, an illustration on how this principle works. If we are to be the standard of truth in this world, we need to show forth His glory. If we are to show forth His glory, we need grace and truth. Those are the two ingredients to become carriers of the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It says, and he, the son, the second part, is the radiance of his, the father's glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. He, the son, is the radiance of his, the father's glory, and the exact representation of his nature. As he is, the Bible says, so are we. If he was the radiance of his father's glory, so should we be the radiance. Radiance speaks to visible light. It speaks that when someone looks, they see, oh, something, something's different about this one. Okay, but I, I, won't go, I won't go into this one. I think we've established that point enough. Now, We can grow in representation. We were created to carry the image and likeness of God, and we reflect that. That's what we call representation. We're representing God. And we are to grow in this representation. James chapter 1, verse 23 says, verse 23 to 25, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, Everybody say mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So James is comparing engaging the word of God to engaging a mirror. You can call this the mirror of the word of God. He's saying when a principle from God's word is revealed to us, it's, it's, it's equivalent to us looking in the mirror and saying, oh, I, I, need to, I need to wipe this off my face. 
I need to wipe this sin, this habit, this mentality. And what James is saying is, if we look at this murder that's held before us and God's standard projected to us, if we look and see what's wrong, but walk away without changing, he says, we're just a hearer, but not a doer. But he says, for those who look intently to this law of liberty, when we stay into the scriptures and this mirror comes before us and we see, okay, I need to adjust this, this, and that in my life. When we make those changes, it says, he will be blessed in what he does. We receive the favor of the Lord. Now, so keep that picture in mind, the word of God as this mirror. Now, Paul says something similar in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says, but we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So Paul is saying, as we behold this mirror of the Word of God, as we behold his glory in the scriptures. He says, we are now being transformed into that image. You know the saying, we are what we eat. Feast on the word of God, we are continually then transformed more and more into this image. But it says, from glory to glory. So as we go about this life, we are to be growing in grace, which translates to us growing from one level of expression, God's nature and character, to another level of expression, God's nature and character. Glory to glory to glory. We are to get stronger and stronger and stronger. We are to become a more solid, immovable pillar of truth. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. We are strengthening the pillar of truth in this post-truth world. Let's look at Daniel quickly, and we'll end off with this. We can skip over to the first Daniel side also. Now, the story of Daniel, it's quite a familiar story. The nation of Israel were taken captive, and they were dispossessed of their land, temple was destroyed, and they were taken into Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar's king, and what the king does, some of the, 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 the higher class citizens of the nation of Israel that were, that were taken as captives, they weren't just menial slaves in Babylon, they were taken to the king's court. And they were treated like royalty in a sense. And we'll pick this up in verse 5. So remember, you're speaking about Daniel, they are exiled in Babylon, and he's not necessarily a lower-class slave, so to speak, that he's been brought into the palace. Daniel 1.5, it says, The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. I mean, you, you can see this is a very high social status. This is literally whatever the king's eating, you will eat. Whatever the king's drinking, you will drink. And you'll be educated for three years. Wait till you get your degree in thinking like a Babylonian. So what was this? The Jews had their own customs when it came to eating, own customs when it came to drinking, and when it came to knowledge and truth, they had their own, their own system. So as comfortable as this picture looks, it's actually taking someone who lives by a standard and trying to dilute it. Trying to change it to a worldly standard. Babylon is a consistent picture of the system of the world. Babylon, Babel, confusion. 
This is what the system of the world wants to do to you and I. It wants to dilute our sonship so that we just conform and fit in and can no longer function as the pillar and standard of truth. Wine in the Bible is a consistent symbol of revelation or ideology. We see in the book of, Re of Revelation especially. So he's saying, Daniel and the young Israelites, drink my wine, take my ideologies and internalize them. So this is, this is the setup here. Now we jump to verse 8. Yes, Daniel's response. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Everybody say, turn to your neighbor and say, make up your mind. Tell the other neighbor too, make up your mind. It says, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's diet. He didn't say, oh, let me taste it and see. He didn't say, let me engage a little bit and I can still keep some of my customs. He says, no, he put his foot down and says, I will not defile myself. And so, this caused some tension because the, the servant of the king who was in charge of all these young men, he would be killed because he's not carrying out the king's orders. He's saying, you must eat this. Daniel's saying, no. So then there's some verses where this guy is now worried. He said, the king will have my head if you don't follow on through with this. Pick it up in verse 12. This is what Daniel then proposes to this governor. He says, please test your servants for 10 days. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he's saying, keep your biryani and your wine. Just give us water and vegetables. And then he says, after 10 days, come and inspect us and compare our health, how we look, to all the others in the king's court who was eating of the king's delicacies. But he says something scary, he says, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. Meaning, if after these 10 days we look all worn and withered, you'll most likely be executed, which means you'll most likely execute us before you are executed yourself. So you're saying, see what happens afterwards. Verse 15. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So we see that at the end of these 10 days, they looked better. They looked better, they seemed better, and they were fatter. And then in verse 17, it speaks about Daniel and his friends. Now after this thing, it says, As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So what do we see? We see the favor of God and the wisdom of God come upon Daniel because he refused to dilute the standard of sonship. He refused to defile himself, himself in his words, with the ideologies, with the worldviews, of Babylon. And what seemed like a setup for death, we actually see his promotion. And it's encouraging 
Because it, sometimes when we are confronted with a situation where we have to fit in with the world or stand up for God's standards, it may seem like, hey, I'm going to die in the sense that I'm going to get canceled. People will never look at me the same. My reputation is at stake if I stand for God and do not just fit in. But what we see, when we take that courageous step of obedience, promotion comes from the Lord. We increase in grace, wisdom, strength. And we far outperform those who submit to the ideologies of the Babylonian system. Okay, so it's better to uphold God's standard than to succumb to the pressure of this world. Now, we skip chapter 2. That's when Nebuchadnezzar has the dream and the interpretation and Daniel's promoted to the, to the head of those who interpret dreams. Fast forward to chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar constructs a giant statue, a monument to himself. And he sets a decree in place that whenever they hear the call, when the music is played, everyone needs to bow down to the statue. So you can be going about your day, you hear the music, you bow down towards the statue. Daniel, or rather the, the, the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refuse to bow down. So the three Hebrew boys, friends of Daniel's, they refuse, again, what are they doing? They are not defiling themselves. They are, they are saying there's only one God, and we are here as the pillar and standard of truth for this God. So we will not bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar. They don't bow, and the consequence of that is they are thrown into the fire, furnace. So that was the punishment. When we know the story, they get into the fire and they're not burnt. Chapter 3, verse 25 of Daniel says, He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So look at what, what, what's being exclaimed here. They threw these men in the fire for standing up for righteousness and they were not burnt. And then when they look closer, they said, no, we put three in, why is there four? And they comment and say, the fourth one has the appearance like a son of the gods. Now obviously they had a plurality of gods in Babylon. So it's the god of the rain, god of fertility, god of this, god of that. So the, the king's comment by saying a son of the gods, that's just his perspective. We have multiple gods. But it's interesting, a pagan you know, king says, these guys stood for something. I put three in. I see the fourth one and what I see is sonship. What I see is the standard of sonship made visible. So the appearance of, uh, and the, the appearance of the fourth man, which many say is, is Christ, wasn't just about Christ coming to save them from the fire. It's saying that it's a picture of when we are in our fire, when we go through a trial, when people see us and they know, oh, we're going through this tough time, they need to see the fourth man. Amen. The glory of God expressed through sonship. So what King Nebuchadnezzar saw was three men in the fire, and he saw a fourth man not necessarily saving them from the fire. Yes, they were saved by God, obviously. But that fourth man represents that in my fire, I will still be the pillar and standard of truth. In my fire, I will still reflect the glory of God. In the good times, we reflect His glory. In the fire, we are still to reflect the glory.
the glory of the Lord. Okay, let's recap in conclusion. We live in a post-truth world. We live in a world where there's no agreed upon objective standards of truth. You do what's right in your eyes, you do what's right in your eyes, we carry on like that. But as the church of God, Paul instructs us that we are to be the pillar and standard of truth in this world. What is truth? Jesus says, your word is truth. We are to be the manifestation of the word of God in our midst. Like Jesus, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. In our purpose of reflecting the glory of God, we need to ensure that we are positioned under the speaking of the word of the Lord because that's truth going forth. And within that truth is the grace that we need. That grace configures our sonship, it establishes our identity, and it empowers us to do for God. We are by grace, and we work by grace. But of G, like Jesus, we can say, if you have seen me, you have seen my Father. The glory that I'm portraying is because of the grace and the truth on the inside. Glory is something that we can grow in. We are to go from glory to glory. Whenever we behold the mirror of God's word and see what needs to be adjusted in our lives, when we make that change, what we are doing, we are going from glory to glory. That reflection of glory is not just for the visible world. We are called to reflect glory to powers and authorities in heavenly places. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks.